Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Logan's Devotions. It's great to be together. Wonderful to open up God's Word for another day and see what he has to say. We're turning through to Luke chapter 15 again, but before I read our passage, as always, let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you today because we know that without your Holy Spirit illuminating the Word of God, we cannot understand it nor benefit from it. And so we do pray that as we turn to this Word, that you would build us up and help us to behold glorious things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 15 and the same verses as yesterday, which say, Now the tax collector and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Yesterday we looked at these three parables briefly and we considered the way that heaven rejoices and the saints in heaven rejoice and God himself rejoices when one sinner is saved. And we thought about whether that's our attitude, whether we too rejoice at the salvation of sinners, whether we rejoice when the outcasts, the lowly and the wretched come and whether we know that we ourselves can come. Today, I want us to look at these three parables again, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son, but I'd like us to consider a different aspect, and, and this brings me to suggest that these parables really have terrible titles, because these parables are not about a sheep, nor are they about a coin, nor are they about a son. Primarily, these parables are about a shepherd, a woman, and a father. And the reason these parables are primarily about these three characters is that these parables are primarily about the way God treats sinners, which flows perfectly out of our previous chapter, doesn't it? The previous chapter was all about these Pharisees and these religious leaders who looked condescendingly and horribly down upon this poor man of dropsy who needed healing on the Sabbath. But here we see a shepherd, a woman, and a father. And I want you to notice, as we look at these, another glorious display of our God and especially the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what we understand when we come to these three parables is that ultimately, Jesus is speaking about himself. Jesus, in a sense, is replying to the grumbling of the Pharisees and the scribes by saying, this is what I am like. Yesterday we saw this is what heaven is like. Today we, say, we see this is what I am like. So let me show you these three pictures of Jesus Christ. Firstly, one of the sheep is lost. Let's see what it says in verse 4. If he has lost one sheep, does he not leave 99 in the open country and, and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? What does this tell us about Jesus? What this tells us about Jesus is that he is willing to risk everything he has in order to find and save and seek one lost sinner. That's nothing like us, is it? You know, you know the sayings, better the bird in the hand than the two in the bush. Maybe you've heard that idiom before. It, you know, it's the idea that if you already have something, you shouldn't give it up in order to obtain something that you don't have. The risk's not worth it. But notice what Jesus Christ is telling the Pharisees and the scribes that he did. He left the riches that he had in order to seek and save the one lost. He would be willing to leave his 99 and go after the one. Because Jesus is a seeker of the lost. But, but notice what else we're told in these parables. We're, we're told this parable of, of the woman. The woman has ten coins, and she loses one of those coins in verse 8. So what does she do? 
Well, she lights a lamp. She sweeps the house. And she seeks diligently until she finds it. I wonder if you pick up a subtly different picture here. In the first one, the primary focus is upon the fact that he leaves the 99 in order to find the one. But here we see a glorious picture of this beautiful woman that, that turns the lamp on and labors hard. She searches every nook and cranny. She sweeps the floor. She looks under the beds. She looks under the uh, cupboards. She, she goes everywhere that a coin could possibly roll. She leaves no, un, uh, no, no stone unturned. She seeks everywhere diligently with hard work until she finds that coin. And it's a picture of our Savior, isn't it? You see, no elect child of God will miss out because Jesus cannot find them. It matters not whether we hide in the bottom of the sea or upon the tallest mountain, in the deepest of forests or jungles, our Saviour will seek and save the children of God. He will do whatever is necessary to go and find. Now, yes, this has implication for us as we think about missions, but don't rush there. See the glory of a Savior who will not give up until His are saved. That's our Savior. That's our Jesus. That's what He did for me. That's what He did for you. He was willing to come all the way to New Zealand to save a miserable wretch like myself. But notice one more picture. It's the picture of the Father. And so the, the first picture is one of someone who would willingly leave everything behind to pursue and seek. The second picture is the picture of the woman who would diligently look everywhere. And then we see the Father. The, the Son has gone away. And the Son has thought of returning. He's had a change of mind, a change of heart. He's remembered that the servants are treated better in his own home. And so he returns. And while he's returning, he's, you know, practicing his speech. He's thinking of what he will say. He says to himself in verse 18, I will return to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he stands up and he arises in verse 20. And notice what we're told. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. He saw him, he had compassion on him, he ran to him, he embraced him, and he kissed him. And notice the son hasn't said anything. This is the picture of Jesus, who while the sinner is wandering, while the sinner is outcast, he's out there somewhere. What is Jesus doing? He's, he's looking, he's watching, waiting. And, and when this sinner comes wandering back, what does he do? He runs to meet him. And he embraces him and he kisses him. And it's a sign of restoration of communion and fellowship and joy and love and peace. There's nothing holding these two apart any longer. And he speaks sweet words to him. He says to him, don't talk about don't talk about being a servant. You're my son. And he dresses him and he puts a robe upon him. He puts a ring upon his finger. It's all a glorious picture of the way our Savior doesn't just seek and save, but he embraces and restores even the most vile, wretched sinner. I mean, who would have wanted to embrace this stinky brother? The stinky son. Well, my Jesus would. And my Jesus did. Because he embraced me that way. And he embraced you that way. This is our Savior. You know, there's that 
old hymn that says, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Is that your song? Is that your heart? When you see the heart of Christ rejoicing at the way he welcomes tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners like you and me? He is wonderful. Isn't it a privilege to be a Christian? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessed Son, 